tradition. He wanted restoration. Uh, Kung Yue wants reform, but both agreed that we like to change the state. Now, we talked about how that he will get the attention of Emperor, the Guangzhou Emperor. That will lead to the 100 Days of Reform. They will issue a bunch of reform edicts, but these are seen as threatening Manchu power, and so the Shishi will have the, uh, the reformers either executed or they'll have to escape. Kang Youwei manages to escape, and she will put the uh, Guangzhou Emperor <coughs> under protective custody. Yes, Del. Is, is that what in the old, in the real story of Aku, Aku mentions like he heard some rumors about the emperor ending the um, exam system is that what what the writer is oh, really? referencing they'll end up later and that's what they're referencing but you're, the connection you're making makes sense it's a good one it's just it's not yet right he's actually referring to what will happen in 1905 but you're thinking in the right way that's good application and remember so the Qing are in this difficult situation they, they don't really want to reform and reform threatens them and since their last card to play was to trust in the power of the Chinese people to over th to push out the Westerners, right? So when you had this anti-Christian, anti-foreign rebellion rise up, the Qing among the peasants, the Qing Empire decides to support it, and they will declare war on eleven countries. They couldn't defeat one, but they're going to declare war on eleven, thinking they can defeat them all with the power of the people. Eight will show up to fight, and will absolutely devastate China. Uh, they will wreak terrible vengeance. One thing I did not mention uh, in the last class, but I should mention, remember how I talked about how the Chinese massacred Christians? The Western empires in Japan will get revenge by massacring Chinese who are non-Christians, uh, and sometimes Christians by accident. So this kind of massacre, this goes back and forth. And of course, they'll also engage in looting. Remember looting the dog? Uh, there'll be more looting uh, as things continue. And China will have to pay 450 million taels, uh, 450 million, million ounces of silver. Remember, their budget is like 90 million a year. So that's a lot of money. So that was kind of review. I'm not going to go too much into this war, but there's another war, and I want to emphasize how weak China is. It's called the Russo-Japanese War. It's fought between Russia and Japan in Manchuria over Manchuria. And you can see in the comic, you have here a Japanese person and a Russian person. They're fighting over the horse symbolizing Manchuria. You have a just a, just a common Chinese person just laying there doing nothing to protect their country, and the Qing government is begging foreigners for help. But the key thing here, look how weak the Qing are. Okay, first of all, they're from Manchuria, and they can't protect it. And so there's a war fought in their country by two foreign countries over who gets to control their country. Right, that's not a good situation. The, to think of something similar, imagine if Canada and Mexico got in a war over California. That's about the closest I can think of. And we have to remember, Manchuria is huge. It's the size of, I think, France and Germany and Austria combined. Manchuria is a huge place. So things are not going well for the chain. So they finally do agree to reform. <laughs> finally, 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 they say to reform. So in 1901, they revise the exam. And they include things to make them more practical, like math and foreign language. So they move away from Confucianism towards technical knowledge. In 1902, they institute compulsory public education. And they start building schools. And they're basically following the Japanese model. If you took my modern Japan class, we talked about, like, I think in 18, I think it's 1872, uh, four years after the Meiji Restoration, they're going to start establishing public schools. China will finally start doing that about 40 years later or 30 years later. I apologize, it wasn't 1868, it was 1872. In 1905, Japan, this is what you're referring to, uh, Dylan, this is what uh, Aq is referring to, they will just abolish the exams. And in 1905, they will establish a commission to study the Constitution. So they're going to become a constitutional monarchy. They end up just copying Japan's Constitution. Right? They end up copying the Meiji Constitution. Japan's awesome. One thing I should have mentioned, so not only does Japan defeat China, in the Russo-Japanese War, Japan is the victor. Right, so Japan will also defeat Russia. So Japan is seen as the, the best predominant power. It's an example of an Asian power that successfully modernized. So many Chinese look to Japan as who they should imitate. In 1908, and I don't expect you, to, by the way, to remember all these years. I'm just giving them so you can see the progression. In 1908, Jishi will finally die. Uh, this was what she tried to reinvent herself as a reformer. That's why she's surrounded by all these ladies, um, even though she supported the, you know, the missionaries and the, 
the Western diplomats being killed, she'll say, oh, uh, that was a mistake, let's all get along now. She dies, so, and now there's no real person who holds power who has the same like political ability she had. She was very conservative, she maybe wasn't the best thing for China, but wow, did she know what she was doing. She was a very good politician, and now she's dead, and there's no one like her to replace her. There's local elections in 1909, based on the Constitution. Japan did this too, right? So they're gonna have local elections. Four out of a thousand people can vote. That's not bad for the time period. It still admits the principle of democracy. So it's not widespread democracy. They have like a property requirement. But still, they're voting in local elections and national ones were slated for 1910. So it looks like things are changing, but then the Qing are overthrown in 1911. So remember they kept talking about the revolution in the Aki reading? It's that revolution of 1911 that they're talking about. Right? It's that revolution of 1911 that they're talking about. So why does that happen? Right? Why does that happen? They're reforming. I thought people wanted reform. Everyone's saying Chinese reform. They want to reform. And the Qing finally reform, and then they fall apart. There's a saying, the worst time for a bad regime is when it tries to reform itself. Or I should say the the most dangerous time for a bad regime is when it tries to reform itself, right? The most dangerous time for a bad regime is when it tries to reform itself. Why? Well, in the case of the Qing, there are several reasons. First of all, notice they abolished the exams. They said no more exams. Well, remember the Confucian scholars and gentry, people like Zheng Guofan, I mean, he's long dead now, but people like him, they supported the Qing because the Qing supported Confucian culture and Confucian civilization. Remember, their power came from their mastery of Confucian knowledge. And they'd spent all this time and money studying for the exams. Now the Qing say it's unimportant. So then they say, okay, we think the Qing is unimportant. To use American political terms, they just alienated their base. Right? They just alienated their base. Their major supporters were the Confucian gentry who focused on Confucianism, and they just said Confucianism isn't important anymore. In addition, they're admitting the principle of democracy. They're trying to transform themselves into a constitutional monarchy. They're saying we want to be more like Britain. But here's the thing. Why should the Manchu rule? They weren't ever elected. Once you admit the principle of democracy, people will point out the very fact that, you know, the Manchu rule us because they conquered us. No one elected them. And once you admit the principle of democracy, you can vote someone out. So that threatens them, right? Some Chinese just say, why? Why should be ruled by these foreigners? We never elected them. Democracy is the most modern civilization. Right? Notice by this time period, the most powerful civilizations were all democracies. The one empire that wasn't a democracy, Russia, just got beaten up by Japan, which was a democracy. So why should the Manchu rule? We just accepted the principle of democracy. We're having elections. They weren't elected, and they're foreigners. Right? There's this concept of nationalism that's going to come up again. Also, remember, the Qing were really doing a bad job. Right? Remember, Zheng Wolfan was loyal, but he was taking care of things himself. The Qing weren't helping him, but they giving him permission to collect taxes, which he would have just had to do anyway without their permission. And elections were sharing power with the provinces. They were having local and provincial elections. Why not just elect a central government? Right? Why keep the Qing? Why should we keep these guys? They're not really doing anything for us. Their government's kind of illegitimate anyway, because they, they're here because they conquered us. So the problem is, the reforms do not satisfy the nationalists and the radical reformers. If these reforms had been undertaken in the 1860s, maybe, this would have worked. It worked for Japan. But the reforms are not taken then. The reforms are taken far too late. The Chinese who want change are much too radical. And many Chinese people are nationalists. They say that China should be ruled by Chinese people. And they mean Han Chinese people, right? not Manchu people. So now the Qing have no supporters, only opposition. So things are not going well for the Qing. Okay, so we had this AQ story. We're a little bit behind, so we can't spend as much time as I would like. But I do want us to talk a little bit about it. Right? Like I said, I enjoyed the story. I hope you enjoyed the story. I think Lu Xun is hilarious. And like I said, when you read that story, you're reading something that like over a billion people have read. So I think it's an interesting story. So what I'd like to do is have the tables group up. So we've got four questions here. So these two tables, if you could turn around and you all will take group question one. You all can turn around and this group together will take question two. 
then you all can turn around and you guys can take question three. And if you all can turn around and take question four. So go ahead and have at it. So you have to, have to turn around, have to talk to people, maybe. Don't use your We care about money and power, and we treat someone based on that. And I think we remember we talked about that example where he got slapped by someone wealthy and powerful, so that people respected him more because he got slapped by someone who's wealthy and powerful. Right? And how are traditional ideas about women challenged? Group four. So we just talked about how, like traditionally, it would have been like more confusion, and mm -hmm. this idea that you know women were like you know, just kind of all alone, and you know, just kind of right. this docile mm -hmm. creature. And yet, whenever it comes, like the nun, right? Right. Like, when she catches uh, a cue, like um, in the convent, and I was just like, what? What are you doing? There's there's a, a shift right, in power, yeah. and then all of a sudden, there's you know, it's as if a cue just. Gondola, she used the word savage. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So even the women pick on this guy. Yeah, and so there's just how that balance of, you know, oh yeah, the man, all, you know, men are greater than women. Right. And then that shifting. Yep. Just for Aki, especially. Excellent. Yeah. 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 And I. Oh. A non worker, and he was doing the, like, uh, people don't want to do that job, and right. he was, like, fired after the, like, the job is done. Right, yeah, yeah, after he was mean to Mrs. Wong, right, then they won't even hire him for that, mm -hmm. right? And I just want to point out, like, you know, that was excellent. A couple other things to kind of think about, right? When, when he thinks, of, remember, he's really mad at that nun for seducing him because he touched her cheek. It's like, it's not her fault, right? You know, you're the, you're the guy that did that. And then he's like, well, th and everyone knows this dynasty fell because of a woman, and this dynasty fell because of a woman, and this other dynasty, well, I don't know, but there must have been a woman somewhere, and that's why it fell. Right. Right, so it's nothing to all the blame on these women, it's making fun of this. It's saying like, we try, you know, this doesn't make sense. And it, it's still mean to kind of, it's still critical to women too, in a sense, right? Because, you know, they change their mind. They want to be chased and keep them far away, but unless he's got nice things to wear, right? So he, he goes after everyone, right? He's, he's very savage with that. Well, excellent, excellent. So in summary, a couple things I want to emphasize about this. The 1911 revolution, which we'll be finishing up this section with, this is being criticized. Right? Remember, the revolution doesn't really bring any changes, does it? Right? You have new people in charge, but it's really the same old people, isn't it? The same, the, the, uh, the exam guy, the powerful local people, they become members of the peach, what was it, the peach oil party. Remember, that's how they mispronounced freedom party. Right? The people in power stay in power. The justice system doesn't really change. They may not make you kneel anymore, but they'll just totally shoot you and make an example of you, should they so choose. Right? So the shape of government had changed, but not the essence of that government or the essence of the Chinese people. So the 1911 revolution was basically, this, the new management is the same as the old management. Nothing has changed. Only deep reforms can save China, and those must impact the whole of Chinese society. Right? So one thing we want to understand, this is especially key for why the communists will eventually take power, is because these earlier, more conservative reforms fail, Chinese intellectuals become increasingly radical. Right? Chinese intellectuals become increasingly radical because the old reforms fail. So before we continue on, I have a couple announcements, and I have a clip I'm going to play for you, and this will make sense shortly. Uh, well, there's two reasons I want to play. I'll talk about that shortly. We might start Section 6 today, more likely Wednesday. If you're interested in the History Club, it will meet Tuesday at 3.30 in the Cobbs Lobby. That's that area on the uh, fourth floor in the College of Businesses and Social Sciences. So if you're interested in going that, I would encourage you to do so. Now, I'm going to play a clip for you, and I've got three reasons why I want to play this clip. One is I meant to do it during the review, but we ran out of time. I like to give people a break, so I, just, I think it's a good one. Uh, and it's from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, how many people have seen that? Okay, a few of you have, right? Um, very good. It was, a, it was interesting because it's a subtitled movie that actually did well in the United States. Those movies are rare, right? Uh, so it's a subtitled movie that does well in the United States. The other reason I want to show it to you, though, I don't want you to think this is set in the Qing Dynasty. I don't want to just end with poor Qing doing so badly, right? We're, we're, we're just beating up on the poor Qing. This shows some of the fun stuff about the Qing. And in this clip you're going to see, you see this young lady who's disguised herself in a, as a man who's going to get in a comedy martial arts fight. And I think it's just, it's a good kind of thing to kind of wake up. But the third thing, and Tianyu, I'm sorry to put pressure on you. On the, the third thing I want you to do when you watch this, her character, what is her ethnicity? 
as you watch it? Like, what is her ethnic group? Uh, uh, Helen's person. No, as you watch it. Oh, oh. Right, what is her person? Like, what, what is her ethnicity as you watch it? I, I, I'll explain why shortly. I, I want to see how Tian Yu answers. So she's just been challenged to a fight by a bunch of local uh, thugs. <laughs> that's the name of her husband, or the man she's betrothed to. So that's why she hates the name. make people in my honors class watch that movie, so I think it's really good. But like I said, I want to give you a good taste of the Qing, right? You had those kind of adventure stories. Um, but here was the other thing. So Tian Yu, what was her ethnicity, do you think, in the movie? Not the actress, but the, the person in the movie. What do you think she was? I think she's red. No, I'm sorry, her ethnicity, like ethnic group. Is she Mongol? Is she Han? Is she Manchu? Oh, oh, oh. I, I mean, I, maybe I think uh, I can't. I can't uh, recognize. Okay, excellent. So you couldn't tell in the movie she's she's Manchu, uh. right? And I don't know if she's actually Manchu or not. But the key thing I want to emphasize is that even though China has many different minorities, there's today 56 recognized minorities. 95% of people are Han, so they're the same ethnicity as Tian Yu. Uh, Tian Yu is Han. Um, there's also these minorities. You can't tell them apart by looking at them. Right. So she is said to be Manchu. I don't think the actress is actually Manchu, but in the, you could tell by how someone was dressed in the time period. She's dressed as Han, so she was acting Han, but she was actually Manchu. And there's a big part of the movie where she says, I'm a Manchu. Right? And she's trying to talk to a guy from Xinjiang. And it's interesting that she tells him that she's a Manchu. So this goes to this question, who are we? Remember, we talked about the beginning of this class. This is something that was an issue for the Chinese. Who are we? Are we, what is our first primary identity? Are we Qing? Are we um, Manchu? Are we Han? What's the most important thing? Right? And so they're going to start borrowing ideas of race that are going to build on some ideas they already had, but we don't have time to go into that, from the West. So there's going to be this understand, there's going to be debates among the Chinese about race. Because you can no longer say, if we get rid of Confucianism, we can't say being Chinese is being Confucian. Right? Remember, that's what Kong Yo Wei is kind of doing. He's saying Chi being Chinese is not connected to this uh, original Confucianism. He tries to present Confucius as a reformer. Other people go even farther and say being Chinese doesn't really have anything to do with being Confucian. It has to do with race. Right? It has to do with issues of race. It's biological. To be Chinese is to be biologically something. So this is, a, uh, this is actually from like the 20s or 30s, but it, it, it brings up the trouble with this issue. Right? You can't read this. A wife's unhappiness, that's the name of this comic. 
The sketch illustrated a bitter little joke. This is the caption. Modern wife out with her husband looks at his face and gives a sigh. When you look at that, she says, my silk stockings, my leather shoes, my gloves, my handbag, the new hat I bought yesterday, everything I have goes with my new outfit. The only thing that doesn't match it is your unmodern yellow face. What can be done about that? And so there's this question here, can non-white people become modern? Right? Can non-white people become modern? That was a question, I mean, to us that sounds kind of crazy, but that was a question people had in the early 20th century. Right? It was a question people had especially about Japan, and some people, uh, by the way, some people ask, like, why would the Nazis work with the Japanese? I thought the Nazis were really racist. Nazi race scientists claimed that the Japanese were actually white. So I don't know how that works, but that's how they dealt with it. But there was this question in the early 20th century. Why is it that Western empires are so powerful? Why is it that white people and the Japanese are the biggest, strongest countries, and why have they colonized most of the world? And some people answered that question biologically by saying it had something to do with race. Right? If you've taken my class before, I have to argue it just has to do with following the four revolutions. But in any case, at the time, people thought it had to do with race. So there's this thing called social Darwinism that's going to be impacting how the, Jap how the Chinese think about themselves. And in social Darwinism, it's the application of Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest to human societies, nations, or races. They divided this up in different ways. It depended on who you asked. Some people would say it was like you know France versus Germany versus Spain versus the United States. But some people broke it up into races, and they would use color terms. They would say it's like the reds and the yellows and the browns and the blacks and the whites. Uh, those were the, the major races. Right? So the key thing was you had this idea of that, you could, that human beings were not like one single group. We are multiple different groups divided by race or ethnicity, whatever you want to say, and we're in a competition of survival for the fittest. And there was a question, where do Asians fit in? And this is, this is like one of the least racist pictures I could find that illustrates this from the time period. If you look this up on the web, you'll find lots of really racist ones, but you can see white people are in the center. Right? We're the ones that, you know, we did it. We're the biologically superior ones. That's why our countries are so powerful. Where do these other people fit in? And so there, there's, I'm going to introduce this guy later, but one Chinese person wrote this. They, being white people, and these are the terms they use, by the way. They use color terms. They will enslave us and hinder the development of our spirit and body. The brown and black races constantly waver between life and death. Why not the 400 million yellows? Right, so there's this kind of fear. What's going to happen to us in this social Darwinistic world? Right? You've seen what the whites have done to the browns and the blacks and the reds. He doesn't mention them. That, that, that would be Native Americans, by the way. What are they going to do to the yellows? So there's a sense of urgency. If we don't reform now, we might be destroyed. Right? Our race might cease to exist. So notice Chinese people are being defined not by adherence to Confucianism or believing or uh, speaking Chinese or anything like that. It's more of a biological sense. Right? What makes us Chinese is our biology. And here's the other thing that's really disturbing about this idea. If you're destroyed, you deserve it because this is just the laws of science. It's survival of the fittest. You, you weren't fit enough to defend yourselves. Guys had it coming. You should have been better. The superior one wins. Right? So you can't even really complain and say this is unjust. This is a scientific law. Right? The strong survive. The weak perish. You should have been stronger. By the way... Um, Oh, sorry. Daye, is it Yong, Yuk, Kong, or no? Yeah, Kong, Shik. Yeah, okay, excellent. So it's the, uh, one thing, Chinese is so efficient, right? Chinese is so efficient. The survival of the fittest, they say, in these really neat, this kind of four-word phrase, strong eat, weak meat. The strong eat and the weak are meat. And that's what I recited to Daye. I'm sorry, uh, can you? It, I don't. It's 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 the character for me, and then weak, and then strong, and then eat. Yeah, I know you know it. It's just right, yeah. I, I don't. I'm mispronouncing right. it. But it's very clever. But the whole thing is that that's just how the world works. If this happens to you, it's your fault. So we Chinese, we need to shape up because our biological race is threatened. The man who qu said that is a man named Yan Fu, and Yan Fu is kind of an interesting guy. Uh, I like to say he studied Western knowledge before it was cool. So even in like the 1880s, when a lot of Chinese people said, ah, oh, we're doing fine, we don't really need Western knowledge or Western information, he said, no, this stuff is totally important, we should study it. 
and he's going to learn English really, really well, and he'll translate a bunch of texts. He'll translate, um, especially after this. He's doing this before the Sino-Japanese War, but afterwards people start taking him seriously. Beforehand, uh, they're like, oh, we're fine. But after they get beat by Japan, they say, okay, we've got to take these ideas seriously. So he will bring in books on liberalism. Uh, liberalism in the United States, we often conflate like liberal and Democrat, but actually liberalism in this sense refers to like Republicans too. It just refers to like a liberal democracy. So this would be like countries like the United States, Great Britain, and France. He translates Adam Smith and also works on social Darwinism. So he's the guy that says this. So he's bringing in all these ideas. So he's an admirer of the West, a critic of China, and he sh represents a shift away from the Qing dynasty. Right? Kang Youwei looks at the Qing and says the Qing state is able to reform China, so we should stay part of the Qing. That will be good for China. It's okay if they're Manchus. And remember Kang Youwei, he has to flee. He actually runs away to Japan after the Hundred Days Reform is crushed. He forms the Save the Emperor Society because he wants to rescue the emperor from uh, Shishi. But this guy is starting to say, eh, we're fundamentally different from those Manchu. We are biologically different from those Manchu. Now it's tricky because you can argue that the Manchu are yellow too. Right? And I think Yan Fu may have done that, but we have the beginnings of this movement away where Chinese people will start saying we're biologically different from these other people. Now there's other even more radical ideas coming into China. These often flow from the West through Japan. Right? One thing, it's very difficult for Chinese people to learn English. It's not very hard for Chinese people to learn how to read Japanese because of all the Chinese characters. Right? Japanese, Chinese people can speak, pick, up, pick up written Japanese really quickly. And so a lot of Japanese, or, I'm sorry, a lot of Chinese are going to start learning about Western ideas from people like Yang Fu, but also through Japan. They're going to learn about anarchism. They're going to learn about socialism. Well, we won't talk about those two much. Well, we'll talk about socialism. They're going to especially learn about Marxism, and they'll learn about feminism. We'll talk about her briefly lady, but there's a wo later, but there's a woman named Ding Ling. Do you, can you, do you study, do you, do you read Ding Ling when you're, I don't know if you've heard of her, Ding Ling? Part of my pronunciation, I'm sure. I don't think she's, a, she's not as important as Lu Xun. But there was a, a, a woman named Ding Ling. Oh, Ding Ling. Oh, Ding Ling. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't get the darn tones. That's, that's my problem. But yeah, you know her. Okay, good deal. She will write a book called The Diary of Miss Sophie. And it's named after Sophie Perovskaya, who helped assassinate a czar, like a Russian czar. So some Chinese are getting some very radical ideas. I mean, that's pretty darn radical when you write a book and you name the main character after the assassin of a czar. Right? The Diary of Miss Sophie. So I want to stress, all these radical ideas are coming in. Japanese, in Japan, people, did, the government hated these ideas. Japan had a successful liberal revolution. But remember, Chinese people are becoming more radical because their government keeps failing. And they got this idea, we need to make deep reforms. Another person, I'm sorry, Tian, you want me to keep doing this? Do you know this guy? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's his picture. OK, so not such a big deal. But in Western understanding of Chinese history, he's very important. So Zorong was educated in Japan. Right. He's, 1885. He's born in 1885, so he was like 10 when Japan defeated China. And when he gets old enough to study, he's going to go to Japan to study. It's cheaper to go there than the United States. And like I said, for J Chinese people to learn to read Japanese is really, really easy because the characters are the same. And he becomes convinced that, that Han must overthrow the Manchus to make a strong China. So these ethnic racial ideas are going to start leading Chinese people to say, we don't want the Qing. These guys are useless. And they don't talk about the mandate of heaven. They talk about ethnicity and race. They talk about ethnicity and race. So in 1903, when he's 18 years old, right? so about not much younger than you, this guy's taking some very strong political views, he will write something called the Revolutionary Army. I'm going to give you some quotes for it later. I just want to note now, he, was given, he wrote this in a foreign concession because if he would have written it outside, he would have been killed by the Qing. Since he was in a foreign concession, he was given two years in prison. Unfortunately, he got sick in prison and died. He was only 19, so he didn't last very long. But in the Revolutionary Army, he argues that all people, men and women, have rights that should be protected by the government. And they should help choose their government. So he's arguing for democracy. And he includes women in this. Right, so this guy is being, being influenced by these very modern ideas. Yes, Chris? So he wants to Give them the right to 
Ah, we'll, we'll see what he's going to. Good question. Let, I'll let him answer that because I'm going to give you some quotes. All people should actively serve the state, either by paying ta taxes and or serving in the army. So he has this, this is a very nationalistic idea. All people are a member of the nation state. All people should serve and fight for the nation state. So remember, Chinese sometimes would say, in the South, would say, oh, we don't care about that, the war, it's about the people in the North. Remember how Chinese people were selling stuff to the British and like active informers? That's what he's against. He wants to form nationalism. All Chinese should care about the nation because what happens to the nation affects all Chinese people. If you're part of a strong nation, your life is better. If you're part of a weak nation, your life is worse. It's very simple. So all people need to work for the good of the nation. Now, going to Chris's comments, what's going to happen? Question, a very good question. What's going to happen to the Manchus? This is a quote from the Revolutionary Army. What you fellow countrymen today call court, he means the government, government or emperor, are what we once called barbarians. Right? Remember how the Chinese had, the Manchu had to become civilized by accepting Confucianism? These tribes were not by origin of the same race as the illustrious descendants of our yellow emperor. Their land is a foul land, they are a furry race. Their hearts are beast hearts. Their writing is different from ours, and their clothes are different from ours. So it's this very interesting to understand what it means to be Chinese, because in part it has to do with custom and language. Remember how we talked about how the Manchu preserved those things to make sure they were different so they didn't get absorbed? But also it's biological. Right? He says their origin is their race is different. And there's even geographical. They're from a foul land. Right? And that's why they're so furry. Right? <laughs> it means they're like animals. But it's just, it's just kind of, it, it, it just, the English doesn't translate well. We wouldn't call someone a furry race. And again, going to what you're saying, Chris, uh, he called on in that book to overthrow the barbaric government established by the Manchu people in Beijing, to drive out Manchus who live in China or kill them to take revenge. So they, they don't get a vote. They, they get to die or leave. And the emperor should be killed in order to assure that there will never be another such emperor. This is pretty darn radical stuff. You can see why the Qing wanted to kill this guy. Right? He wants not only to overthrow the Qing, he wants to make China for, it's not quite clear, but it would seem to be for Han Chinese only. We don't want these Manchus here. We don't want them. Now, what I think I want to stress is this doesn't just impact men. Right? Remember, he himself was something of a feminist. And there's a woman named Ju Chin. I assume you know her, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, she's very famous, right? Lots of, lots of statues to her. She is both a nationalist and a feminist. Right? She's a nationalist and a feminist. She is married to a man she doesn't love. It's an arranged marriage. So she will take her jewelry. She's from a wealthy family. Flee to Japan and invest her jewelry so that she can study. She'll like enroll in schools in Japan. Right? So Japan is like this wonderful way for Chinese people to learn about the West. And also the China, I, I don't want to stress, it's the fact that the Japanese managed to borrow Western ideas while staying Japanese. So Chinese people want to learn how to borrow Western ideas while staying Chinese. That's kind of the, the similarity. So she will flee to Japan in 1903. While there, she will dress up as a man often. Right? She'll wear Western men's clothing. She'll, she'll wear like a suit and tie. And she's trying to assert, in a sense, that women can do what men do. Right? I just wear a suit and tie, and look, I can do the exact same thing you guys can do. So women should also have equal rights. She will then return home to China and join a revolutionary group and write against things like foot binding. Like she's very opposed to foot binding. Right? You can imagine if it's difficult for women to walk, how can they actively participate in society if they can't even walk because they're toddling, or they can't walk very far because they're toddling around? And she will take part in what's called the 1907 Aqing Uprising. Basically, it's an attempt to overthrow the Qing government, which involves assassinating a Qing governor. So she was willing to use violence. So please note what she's holding there. Right? And I think this is really striking. Right? Can you imagine a Chinese woman posing with a knife? Right? You probably are familiar, like if you're an American, you've seen all those American pictures from the Civil War, like the portraits where the people, the guys have their guns and things. Imagine if it was a woman. Right? Even for us, that'd be a little surprising during that time period. But like I said, she's posing with a knife, and she took part in a political uprising. Now, she was wealthy, but even wealthy women typically weren't involved in politics in China. You had to be like an empress or the wife of someone powerful. She wasn't, right? She was alienated from her husband. So she's an example of a woman taking action on her own. 
Right? She's a woman who's taking political action on her own. Now, what's really interesting, too, I want to point out, is that uh, a few, maybe five or six years ago, I'm sure, do you all know uh, uh, Jackie Chan? You're right, great martial arts. By the way, people who like Jackie Chan movies make fun of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon because the martial arts aren't as good as Jackie Chan movies. And there's a joke like, yeah, I could fly too if I had wires on me. But Jackie Chan, you know, like all great actors, wants to direct. And he directed a movie called 1911, After the Revolution. And it is, I think, and I don't know if you've seen the movie, can you? I think it's a pretty terrible movie. Because <laughs> it's really just too nationalistic. But it's so good, it's, or it's so bad, it's cheesy. So it is worth watching. And the movie begins with the execution of Chu Jin. So I have to show you this clip since we're talking about Chu Jin uh, of her execution. Does this have English subtitles? Dubbed. So it's not as good. I'm sorry. <laughs> I apologize. When I ripped the DVD, it doesn't. It didn't, at the time, I, I didn't have a choice. No woman has shed blood for the revolution yet. I will be the first. The revolution will create an enduring home for all people. It will help form a peaceful and calm world for all children. The long enslaved masses became known long ago. They do not know peace. Not These two children are about to lose their mother. Today I die for all children. <clears throat> I think she means all Chinese children. Yes. So, one thing I want to stress, notice we've talked about how China was divided into different status groups and definitely divided by gender. Right? Remember there were different rules for men and women. Like men could play around, right? women can't. Right? Women can have their foot bound, men don't. There's all these different rules. But now you can see in the name of the Chinese nation that those divisions are being taken away. Those divisions are dissolving. All people, all Chinese people need to work for the benefit of the nation. Now, Chu Jin died for the country. Sun Yat-sen, a lot of people wanted to kill him, but he was an expert survivor. So we'll talk about him starting on Wednesday. We'll continue this, and hopefully we'll start Section 6. I hope we start Section 6. Goodness. There's just too much Chinese history. Oh, God. It's all interesting. When is 